For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever would believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3.16. But then the next verse, just as important, John 3.17. For God did not send his Son into this world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. John 3.16 is probably the most memorized Scripture passage in all of the world. It's called the gospel in a nutshell. It tells the whole gospel story in a very short, succinct way that God loved so much that He gave, and when we believe we have, we have life everlasting. And notice that God didn't come into this world to beat the world down in condemnation, but to set this world free from sin. So this world, that all who would come to Jesus in faith would be given the guaranteed hope of life everlasting. That is the purpose of my life, to let the world know that. That's the purpose of the Christian church, to declare that before the world, who God is and what He has done to bring life to all who would believe in His Son, Jesus Christ, who died and rose again for all people to be reconciled to God. Did you notice, though, that the important part of that message starts with God having love for the world? And when we think about His love for the world, that includes every single person who is on the face of this planet is created by God and loved by God. That means that every person that we encounter, whether they look like us, talk like us, act like us or not, that they are a person who has been loved by God and that there is a Savior who came to die for them, rise again for them, and desires them to be saved, to come to a knowledge of who Christ is and to receive Him as their Lord and as their Savior. And that changes everything for us. That changes how we view this world. That changes how we look at our neighbor. That changes how we look at our coworker, how we look at our students in the classroom, how we look at our teacher at the front of the classroom, how we look at our boss, how we look at our employees, how we look at our spouses and our children, our in-laws and our outlaws, how we look at everyone changes when we look at them with the love of God in Jesus Christ. We want to have conversations with people that would lead people to know more of who God is and His love and how He desires them to know Jesus Christ. If we truly love our neighbor, We are going to share Jesus Christ with them in word and in action. If we really love them, we will want to be in heaven with them. It is our calling to share that good news that God so loved the world that He gave. For whom? For all the world. For every person in it. So that by believing in Jesus, they shall not perish but have life everlasting. Jesus set the standard for sharing that good news with people even people who didn't understand, even people who didn't accept, even people who may not have come to Him at first with the greatest of intentions. And such is the case in John chapter 3 with a man named Nicodemus. Nicodemus, John chapter 3 says, was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He was a senator, if you will. He was a member of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish body of governance that ruled over things in civic life and also in religious life. There was no Jeffersonian separation of church and state. They were all one in the Sanhedrin. Well, these were the big shots, and Nicodemus was one of them. And Nicodemus, who was a Pharisee, so he was a a follower, a legalistic follower of God's law, came to Jesus because he had some questions for him. He had probably heard the stories of Jesus bringing healing to many people who had, he had heard of Jesus, who had come from Galilee and started to work wonders and signs and to attract a crowd as people started to follow him, as he taught them and loved them. And Nicodemus steps out from his association in the Sanhedrin, and he comes to Jesus, but notice when he does. He comes to him at night, so under the cover of darkness so that people wouldn't have been able to see him do it. He was still a seeker. He wasn't all in, but he wanted to check Jesus out for himself. 
And yet he was probably scared of what other people would have thought of him and how they would have judged him for doing so. So he comes to Jesus at night, and notice what he says. He says, Rabbi. So he gives Jesus a title that is a title of respect in the Jewish culture. It means teacher. Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who comes from God, for no one could perform the signs that you are doing if God were not with him. And Jesus cuts through that flattery, and he cuts straight to the point, and he says, amen, amen, which is translated very truly, 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 I am telling you that no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. So Jesus cuts to the chase with Nicodemus. He wants to know where Nicodemus stands in relationship to the reign and the rule of God. And he wants to invite Nicodemus to experience that kingdom of God. And notice Nicodemus then follows Jesus' statement up with a question. He, he says, well, how can someone be born when they're already old? Surely you cannot enter a second time into your mom's womb in order to be born. And so Nicodemus asks an honest question, but notice that he went to Jesus because he sees him as a teacher. Now, we know that Jesus is not just a teacher, but he is the ultimate teacher. He is the one who is the ultimate leader and instructor for our lives. He is the capital R rabbi. He is the capital T teacher. He is the capital P prophet. He is the one who not only proclaims God's word, but he embodies the word of God in his human flesh. And we know that as the ultimate teacher, Jesus is also the ultimate deliverer, savior, and rescuer who came for all the world, as we read a little bit later in John 3, because of the love of God for all the world. He's the Savior, and he knows Nicodemus, and he wants Nicodemus to know him. But in order for people to experience that, they need, says Jesus, to be born, to be born in a different way. And so the Greek word anothen is what we have here in our passage from John chapter 3. And commonly in our English translations, it's rendered as born again. So anothen can either be translated as again, that is a second time, or it can be translated as from above, from a different place, not from down on the earth, but from heaven, from above. Throughout the Gospel of John, that word anathen, anathen, anathen typically is best translated as from above. So is Jesus talking about being born a second time or being born from a different place? I tend to think the answer is yes. It's both. Now, there's a coffee mug on the screen in front of you right now, and this is the longest standing coffee mug in the collection of Pastor Jeff Alexander. This coffee mug is a ceramic mug that I purchased in the 1990s when I dreamed of being able to go to the seminary one day and become a pastor. Concordia Seminary has been a fixture in St. Louis, Missouri for many, many years. In fact, it's one of the oldest Lutheran seminaries in North America. And the seal of the seminary is what makes this mug so special because it is imprinted on the side of this mug that is in my office. And at the center of it are the Greek capital letters, anothen tophos. And if you don't know Greek, then you look at the picture, because pictures will tell you what the words are saying. And you can look very closely, and there is sun that's shining from on high and breaking through the clouds. For anothen means from above, and tophos is the Greek word for light, light from above is the motto of this seminary school who for generations has trained pastors to go out and tell the good news of Jesus. Anathen, from above, a light that shines just as light on our planet doesn't start on the ground and go up, but the sun gives light to all, and our light flows from the light that then comes from above first. And so it is with being born from above or born again, it is born in a new way, a new life that God is calling people to. He did it for Nicodemus, and he does it for us. Because in order to come into God's rule and reign, that is, into his kingdom, Jesus wants to bring God's kingdom to people and bring people into God's kingdom through his light that comes from above. That's his mission. 
When he started preaching the gospel at the beginning of his earthly ministry, he actually preached it very clearly. He said, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. That was also John the Baptist's sermon, and yet Jesus, in preaching it, fulfills that sermon and brings it in a different way. Because when Jesus would say to people, repent, that means to to turn, to change. That means to turn away from sin and death and brokenness and to turn towards God for mercy and restoration. Repent. Why? For the kingdom of God is at hand. And when Jesus would say the kingdom of God, that is his rule and his reign is here, he was referring to the kingdom of God, his rule and his reign being so near that you could touch it that you could experience it because Jesus brings God's reign in human flesh into this world so that living perfectly, he would then die sacrificially to take the sin of our lives away. God wants people to come into his kingdom, and in order for that to happen, he wants to give them a fresh start, a new life through the forgiveness of their sins. So this dialogue between Jesus and Nicodemus goes on. It's a, it's a prelude, a, a, a preview before Jesus gets to the gospel in a nutshell of John 3.16. So we want to understand this context. Jesus answers Nicodemus. He says, very truly I tell you, amen, amen, it says, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born. And here he describes what he means by anothen, born from above or born a second time born of water and the Spirit. So he's talking about a different kind of birth. For flesh, what we are in our flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying you must be born anothen, again, a second time, born from above. For the wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going, and so it is with everyone born of the Spirit. So now you can imagine that Nicodemus, when he's dialoguing with Jesus, is having light bulbs go on. He's not talking about crawling back in into the belly of my mama. He's talking about being born in a different way, a new start a new life, that entrance into God's kingdom is given to us by means of being given new life. And how? By water and the Holy Spirit, says Jesus Christ, that there is a new birth, a new start that is given by the means that God has established, that the church didn't come up with the idea of water and the Holy Spirit being the means by which we are given a new start. But Jesus himself instituted this gift, this gift that we know is baptism, the gift that includes the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, a fresh start where the sins are drowned in the waters of our baptism, and our new life is raised with Christ through the working of God. That God, as he says in the Old Testament, when a person comes to him in faith, he takes our sins away and he casts them as far as the east is from the west and remembers them no more. That God completely removes transgressions from people. And he does that through the new life that he gives to us when we come to Jesus in faith. We can't understand this fully. Nicodemus didn't. And no one that we will ever share the gospel with will be able to fully get it. You don't intellectualize yourself into the kingdom of God. As a matter of fact, even those of us who have read the Bible many times and spent time studying theology, the closer that I get to God, the more I realize that I don't know. I can't comprehend His works and His ways. I don't fully understand. In the perspective of God being sovereign and almighty and all-powerful and all-knowing and all-present. I am so, so small, and my mind is so, so small. How can I ever wrap my mind around the mystery of God? And that's why I go back to His Scripture, His Word, and that what He reveals in His Word, I bank my life upon it. And so what He tells us is that even though we can't understand and comprehend 
the work of the Holy Spirit, we will see the effect of the Holy Spirit on our lives. And notice what Jesus does. He again uses a word that can be understood in different ways. If anathen can mean born again or born from above, so it is with the word of ruach. So it is the word of, in Greek, pneuma. Pneuma, it's where we get pneumatic or pneumonia. It means breath. It means spirit. And it also means wind. The pneuma, the pneuma, the pneuma, however you want to pronounce it. It's where we get pneumonia and pneumatic, the P in the end that sounds kind of funny together. It comes from the word that means breath and also wind and also spirit. So Jesus is talking about the Holy Spirit who ultimately is incomprehensible, and what does He compare it to? He compares it to wind that blows. Now, have you ever seen the wind? Have you ever seen the wind? The closest I've ever seen, uh, come to seeing the wind is being in the Great Plains. Maybe you've been in the Dakotas or Nebraska or Wyoming or Colorado or Montana, and you've been there and you've felt the wind just come sweeping across the plain. And in Florida, they call it hurricanes, and there they call it a breezy day. I mean, it's, it is just rushing across the plains. But have you seen the wind? Now, you may see the tumbleweed blowing in the wind. You may see the shopping cart in the Hobby Lobby parking lot blow 100 meters across and slam into a car. You may have your face blown and your hair blown in the wind. But have you seen the wind? No. You see the effects of the wind, and so it is with the working of God, that we don't see that working in a way that we can fully comprehend it. We see water, we see word, we see it displayed in bread and wine, we see it in the water of baptism, we see it through the means of God's grace as we open up the Scriptures, but you know how we see the Spirit at work? We see it in the effect it has upon our lives and how God is in the business of changing people's lives, and how God is in the business of transforming people's hearts and lives for eternity. We don't see the wind. We see its effect. When you go and share the love of Jesus Christ with someone else, and you see the change that happens in them once they know God's love, the Holy Spirit is at work. He is affecting people's lives and hearts in a way that we can't comprehend, and that is a blessing to us and a blessing to those that we reach with the gospel. I love how Paul, in his letter to Pastor Titus, in Titus chapter 3, describes this gift in this way. He says, God our Savior has saved us, not because of the righteous things, the good things, the God-pleasing things that we had done. No, but because of His mercy, He saved us. Notice that order. God is the one who has done the work of saving our lives. We have not earned our way into heaven. God has saved us in Jesus Christ. And then through, we would refer to baptism as as a means of grace. It's not a work that we do, to please God. It's a means through which God does His work in our lives through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us, poured it out generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by grace, what is the effect of the wind? What is the effect of the Holy Spirit? We become heirs, that is, those who receive an inheritance, a gift the inheritance gift of everlasting life, the hope, the guarantee of everlasting life because God the Father has poured out that gift into our hearts through Jesus Christ our Savior. Some of you know that my mother was raised in a free will Baptist home, and I'm so thankful for members of my extended family who taught me how to love the Lord and to trust in Him in a personal way, and that includes my grandma and my grandpa Chester, who are now with the Lord in glory. But one thing that my grandma Chester could not get past was why I was never baptized by immersion. She said, you were just sprinkled. That's what she would say. You were just sprinkled. Now, I would beg to differ with my mom. I would say, actually, you know, I, had, I was poured over. I wasn't just sprinkled. I mean, it was a pouring. 
But she couldn't get past the idea of never being fully immersed. Now, here's the thing. When we start arguing about the form of water, whether it's water in Pirate's Cove out in Southern California, where I saw in the movie Jesus Revolution about Chuck Smith and his great ministry in the late 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, on to the 21st century, and people being baptized in large numbers in the Pacific Ocean, praise God, or in a Jordan River, praise God, in a baptistry inside a Baptist church, praise God, or in a little font like this at a church like ours where there is a little bit of water poured over a person's head. God is doing the doing. This is not our work that we do for Him. It's His work by, by means of which He is working in our lives. And that gift is given to all, to all that our Savior Jesus Christ died for, and it's been poured out upon us. That's what I would say, hey, Mama, hey, I had it poured out upon me, Right? And through that work, I died with Jesus Christ, and I was raised to new life with Him. And so it is the effect of that upon all of those who believe and testify to the Lord Jesus Christ that He saved us through the pouring out of His Holy Spirit. What a wonderful, amazing gift that God offers to those who would want to come into His kingdom. And the beautiful thing about that is that it has a completed work that it unites you to with an ongoing, lasting effect. And here's what I mean. Romans chapter 6, where Paul's writing in another parallel passage, says this. He says, don't you know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ, who have been washed in Christ, were baptized into His death? So that whether you were sprinkled or poured over or immersed, water connected with the Word, whether it was running water or still water, fresh water or salt water, just water from the tap or triple distilled reverse osmosis water, it does not matter. It's water connected with God's Word. And through that, what happens? This is the important part. We were therefore buried with Christ through baptism into His death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, what's the gift? We too may live a new life. For if we have been united with Him in a death like His, we will certainly be connected with Him, united with Him in a resurrection like His. So God the Father has already done the completed work to save you when Jesus Christ died upon the cross. When were you saved? About 2,000 years ago, when my Savior bled and died for me, that's when I was saved. And that completed work that Christ did upon the cross became personal in my life when God the Holy Spirit connected me and He saved me. And in my personal story, that started in July of 1979 when my parents brought me to the water of baptism. And you know what God did? God exchanged something with me there that He took the completed work of Jesus Christ that satisfied the requirements of the law. He took His perfect life. He took His sacrificial death. He took His triumphant resurrection. And then He took my wages, my sin, which equals my death, and He exchanged them. And He took my death and made it His so that He could take Jesus' life and make it mine. That I deserve to die, and Christ doesn't, but Christ dies so that I may live. And when in faith we believe and trust in Jesus who came into this world because of God's eternal love, what's the gift? That all who believe may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that the gift we receive is new life in Jesus Christ. Nicodemus, Jesus wanted him to know that. Did he ever truly know in his heart that Jesus was his Lord and Savior? We see Nicodemus two other times in the Gospels. Later, he's gone from being a seeker to being a defender of Jesus, wanting Jesus to have a fair shake, a fair trial, and not some kangaroo court like the other members of the Sanhedrin wanted. He defended Jesus. And then do you remember what happened after Jesus had died upon the cross? He worked with another man named Joseph of Arimathea, and they took Jesus' body and they laid it in the grave. I believe Nicodemus put his faith in Jesus Christ. 
Nicodemus, who came to him at night, was then the recipient of what Jesus did very early on a Sunday morning, bursting forth from that grave and giving life to you and to me and every Nicodemus out there who would simply come to him and receive his kingdom. May we see this word as being for us, and may we treasure the blessing that it is to be born of water and the Holy Spirit.